Thanks for coming, uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I've wanted to come uh, in the past. It's a little difficult to get away from teaching in the fall to come to Europe, so I'm really excited that I can be here. So the title of my talk has changed a little bit. It's called Weapons of the Geek. And a little bit later on, you'll know uh, where this kind of term comes from. So I'll still be uh, talking about hacker ethics, aesthetics, but mostly about uh, politics. So I'm just going to uh, dive right in. So I'm currently in between two projects, uh, sandwiched in between two projects. And uh, on, on the one hand, I've done quite a bit of work on free and open source software. Um, and then the other side of the invisible sandwich is anonymous. Uh, very soon, there'll be a book out, actually, on my work on free software, so it won't be invisible anymore, hopefully. Uh, and then I'll be doing some work on writing a book on anonymous. And what I want to do today is draw on this research to kind of give a sense of what uh, characteristics might pertain to geek and hacker politics. But to start, what I want to do is narrate two really, really important protest events. Uh, one from the start of my research and one from the current research. All right, so let's start with 2001. It was August 29, 2001, and it was a typical San Francisco day. The abundant morning sun and deep blue skies actually hid the reality of much colder and cooler temperatures. I was attending a protest along with about 50 other programmers, system administrators, and free speech activists who were demanding the release of a Russian programmer, Dmitry Skilrov. Weeks earlier, as he left DEF CON, one of the largest hacker conferences in the world, he had been arrested by the FBI for supposedly violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now, he had supposedly violated the law by writing a piece of software called the Advanced Ebook Processor Software that took um, the, which transformed the Adobe Ebook a format into PDF, and so he basically, in order for the software to do that, you have to break the copy controls um, of the ebook copy format, and this was illegal under the DMCA. Now, once we got to the Hall of Justice, I was dwarfed by the sea of programmers um, and technologists, and they were holding up signs such as, you know, DMCA 1984, do the right thing, free speech. Uh, code is speech, and one of the things that really, really struck out at the time, the, the kind of statement that stuck out the most, was that code is speech. Now, up to this point, I had heard this association before, and in the coming months, I would only come to hear it even more. But at the time, it really dawned on me that this association between code and speech was actually something quite novel. And then, indeed, I went and I poked around, did a little bit of research, and saw that prior to the sort of 1990s, the kind of idea that code was speech uh, didn't really exist in published discourse. And so at that moment, I was like, OK, I think I'm going to write a book about the ways in which free software hackers have come to see source code as a form of free speech. And that was what that project was about, and that's what the book is about. So that was a kind of uh, really important protest event, not simply because I decided that's what I was going to work on, but because people took to the streets to protest a copyright law. All right, so let's fast forward to 2012, and in, in particular January 2012. Governments all over the world <clears throat> were and still are considering signing up to a US-led trade proposal intended to curtail piracy, ACTA which I'm sure people here have heard of, the Anti-Copyright Trade Agreement. There have been widespread protests online and offline uh, all over Europe. Among many, many other participants, Anonymous in particular, the loose-knit collective of activist hackers and other internet denizens, um, are protesting ACTA. They're sort of saying it's an attempt by governments to limit and control the core freedoms of the internet, especially the kind of massive cultural exchange of file sharing and cultural goods. Now, let's go to Poland, uh, late January. The agreement has already been signed off. All that's needed for it to be adopted into law is a majority vote in Parliament. 
The government website at the time is offline, and it was taken down by Anonymous through a denial of service attack. Now something really, really remarkable happens. First of all, there's massive protests on the streets, up to 10,000 people in the capital. But as the website has been taken down by Anonymous, something else really quite remarkable happened. And it was this. On the 26th of January 2012, while casting their votes in Parliament against ACTA, these parliamentarians decided to hold up uh, a paper cutout version of the Guy Fox mask. Now, one person in Anonymous uh, wrote a very nice blog entry about this event, and this is what he said. He said, these parliamentarians were wearing Anonymous Guy Fox masks while the Parliament website was down due to DDoS by Anonymous. I can't emphasize that point enough. This is a game changer. Now, this isn't the end of the story. Um, you know, very soon after this event, about a month later, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal. And this is uh, an image, alert on hacker power play. And the director of the National Security Agency, Keith Alexander, uh, apparently during a set of secret meetings at the White House, makes a certain claim about Anonymous. And this is what he says. Well, this isn't a direct quote. This is what was reported in the Wall Street Journal. Anonymous could have the ability within the next year or two to bring about a limited power outage through a cyber attack. Now, I thought the timing of this was quite significant in certain ways because actually, while Anonymous is nothing but controversial in the geek and hacker community, many people do not support them, and think what they do is really problematic, they never either attempted or claimed to attempt something so rash and problematic as taking down the power grid, right? <coughs> and given the fact that Anonymous had, up to that point, actually become identified with sort of subversive, irreverent uh, protest politics and not simply sort of chaotic acts of violence, this claim did not stick at all. It was actually written off um, by fear, uh, it was written off by most news accounts as an example of fear mongering and sort of went away. We'll never really quite know if that was based on credible information or not, but it did seem like an opportune moment to sort of smear the name of Anonymous just at the moment that it was gaining some legitimacy or credibility. Okay, so in 2001, when the protests against the DMCA peaked, geek and hacker politics were brewing and they had been brewing for some decades. By 2012, when the Polish politicians took on the anonymous mantle, you can say that hacker and geek politics had come to boil. One might even say spill out and pervade and invade many spheres of life. Whether we consider the impact of the Pirate Bay here in Sweden, the Pirate Party's ability to land seats in the European Parliament, WikiLeaks's role in revitalizing the discussion around leaking, Anonymous's use of direct action techniques, uh, telecomics's human rights interventions in the Middle East, and the fact that free software is here to stay, I think we could say with some degree of confidence that the geek and the hacker represents a relatively new actor who's firmly standing on the political stage and whose actions have had measurable geopolitical impact. So if that is the case, what sets them apart politically? Uh, what are the attributes of hacker and geek political action? So that's what I'm gonna attempt today, is to give you 10 characteristics of weapons of the geek. Um, and they're preliminary, they're incomplete, they're partial, uh, and actually I'm hoping to get feedback. Uh, they're not written in stone. And also it's very difficult to kind of come up with these propositions because actually, if I'm going to start with my first point, and there's someone who's going to help the sound soon. Um, if I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the first point, which actually makes clear why it is so actually difficult to come up with you know, a set of statements. And the first point is that hackers are sectarian, uh, but generally productively so. Now, the term sectarian has a lot of negative associations. It can be a very pejorative word to use, and I want to kind of set those aside. But I do want to kind of keep that term sectarian in place, but just bear with me for a moment. Um, now, when you try to define hacking, 
there's a lot of different ways you can identify the similarities among hackers, right? Um, you might sort of talk about the hacker ethic, which are things like commitments to meritocracy, transparency, and access, and you know, many hackers will be like, oh, I abide by the hacker ethic. Um, obviously, a lot of hackers are, are computer aficionados who adore computers. Um, they tend to be committed to civil liberties, which I'm gonna discuss in a moment. But I do actually think it's, it's a real mistake to kind of try to only identify similarities um, in hackers, among hackers. I actually think it's much more interesting to look at the differences among them. And, you know, obviously there's technical differences, uh, whether it is the fact that you may be a programmer, or assistant administrator, or a security researcher. There's builders and breakers, free software developers, hardware hackers might fall into builders, uh, info security hackers might follow and fall under breakers, and there's a lot of differences among them. And so obviously there's a lot of technical uh, differences. But I'm actually also interested in the actual points of contention, the contradictions, the debates that kind of fuel hacking. And um, you know, you hang out just a couple days with hackers and you really see how they're inclined to debate often heartily as to what hacking is, what should fall under the banner of free speech, what is appropriate when it comes to file sharing, um, and basically arguing, you know, is their passion. So it's sort of like the pig in mud, uh, you really realize that after a little while, you know, to, to be a hacker is to debate and argue, and this really kind of slips into the political sphere. So hackers bring various topics or issues, whether it's, you know, the best editor, or what is free speech into intense focus and, and productive dialogue. So what this means tangibly is at a certain moment, you know, Richard Stallman uh, might defend a DDoS uh, campaign, which is what he did with the first action Anonymous took in defense of WikiLeaks when uh, PayPal and MasterCard pulled services. Uh, others, other groups such as Telecomics are like, well, no, that's actually a violation of free speech. Other hackers are like, well, I don't care, it's just lame, right? <laughs> and so one of the things that is really interesting is that they're engaged in this debate through their kind of sectarianism. Now, this type of sectarianism, you know, can produce fragmentation, but I actually don't think it produces massive balkanization. Uh, there's not these, you know, completely separate spheres of action. So I'm really interested in what helps to unite kind of hackers given that there's a lot of differences. And this is my next point, which has to do with the ethic of craft. Um, and so, again, whether it, it lies in the realm of programming, security research, or system administration, hackers move a technical tradition forward, uh, sometimes individually, <coughs> sometimes collectively, striving for and having a high regard for excellence. And here I'd like to quote um, a sociologist who's written quite a bit of, about craft, and this is what he has to say. I think it's a, a really nice, uh, compact definition. He says, craftsmanship names an enduring basic impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. Um, so obviously to craft is to do things like make an editor, make a sweater, uh, blow some glass, so you make Stuff. But it also entails emotions such as pride, an ethics that's focused primarily on quality, but there's also the you know very, very tight social bonds that form between craftspeople and craft makers. And uh, you know, very recently a free software developer came to my class and kind of out of the blue when he's just talking to my class, he said, you know what? Think about writing free software, and, and he's a Perl hacker. He's like, I identify quite strongly with any Perl hacker, whether she's from you know, Brazil or Sydney, much more than just any other kind of citizen in my own nation, you know? And, and the point is, again, that there's very close ties, very close affinities that form between craft people. And, and the reason why I do think this is interesting or relevant when it comes to the question of hacker politics, it means that traditional political affiliation, are you social democrat, are you libertarian, are you an anti-capitalist hacker, is secondary to the kind of craft. 
And a lot of free software projects are really quite amazing because people with very, very different political backgrounds will come together and work together. And this is, I think, a really kind of important condition for understanding the vibrancy, especially of hacker ethics, which then becomes the ground for politics later. But if hacking is a craft, it is not only a craft. Hackers are known to disrespect tradition. They're willing to redirect technology towards some new, largely unforeseen purpose. And so one of the things about hacking is that it's crafty, and there's a lot of trickery involved in the actual kind of practice of hacking. Hackers derive pleasure in outwitting constraints. You say, OK, you have this piece of technology that does it this way, and they're like, huh, I'll do it that way. And in some ways, I think hacking is where craft and craftiness converge very tightly. Um, and again, I'll quote another developer who came to my class. Um, and he's an info security hacker. He likes to break things. And uh, he put it in these very, very nice terms. This is what he said. He says, you have to like, have an innate understanding that it's arbitrary. It's an arbitrary mechanism that does something that's unnatural and therefore can be circumvented in all likelihood. Here, again, he was talking about a security system. He's like, I know it could break it because it's arbitrary. And what interests me um, is the ways in which this kind of uh, mental disposition where you're like, it's arbitrary, I can change it, how that can seep and bleed into the political sphere. Um, and of course, the kind of mothership example of craftiness uh, that seeps from the hacking sphere to the political sphere is the coffee left, which kind of cleverly reformats copyright law. Um, but there's many other instances of this. And actually, it's really quite interesting when you look at the world of anonymous, because in fact, a lot of their political interventions are nothing but inelegant. They're not beautiful, they're not clever, it's kind of brute force uh, attacks. But actually, there are these great, great moments of trickery and craftiness that do come out of anonymous. And actually, uh, in some ways, the very genesis of anonymous from a kind of phenomena that was rooted entirely in internet trolling to one that became activism came out of an act of trickery. And so for those that may not know, I'm going to play just 30 seconds of a very famous anonymous video. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are anonymous. Over the years, we have been watching you, your campaigns of misinformation, your suppression of dissent, your litigious nature. All of these things have caught our eye. With the leakage of your latest propaganda video into mainstream circulation, the extent of your malign influence over those who have come to trust you as leaders has been made clear to us. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed for the good of your followers, for the good of mankind, and for... Okay, who here has seen this video? Okay, so a good portion of people, but not everyone. This video was a joke. It was a bunch of guys who were like, let's just screw around with the Church of Scientology and create a funny video where we declare war against the Church of Scientology. They released it. They had no intention of ever protesting the church. But it was a kind of very, you know, compelling video, a joke that was so compelling, it tricked, again, as trickery, anonymous people who would troll into going, huh, maybe we should actually legitimately protest the church. So their own trickery tricked them into debating the kind of real merits of hitting the streets. And that's precisely what happened. And so again, this is the kind of ultimate example of trickery because they were trying to trick others. And yet they themselves got kind of uh, swept in their own sort of message and decided to legitimately protest the church. And it was at that moment that Anonymous was born as a kind of activist entity. Now, I just emphasize a kind of habit of the mind, anti-authoritarian, crafty, don't accept the rules. This doesn't obviously mean that automatically, because you have these habits of the mind, you're going to enter into the activist sphere. It just means that those hackers who do kind of cross over will often take that kind of disposition. And a lot of the kind of activism will have this quality of craftiness and trickery as well. All right, so let's move from a kind of habit of mind to a, a more sociological factor that, again, 
is really important for understanding the unique characteristics of hacker ethics and politics. And it has to do with something called free spaces. Um, and this is a term that sociologists and social movements have been using since the 1970s to understand places where activities are organized. It could be religious activity. It could be a political activity. It could be a craft activity. But the point is that people come together autonomously and through the kind of uh, activity, there's also alternative ethics and sociality that get produced. And some traditional uh, spaces that have been analyzed by sociologists are co-ops, radical churches, women-only political spaces, independent bookshops, and transnational activist bookshops. And one of the remarkable things, and I think something quite unique, if you compare, let's just say, hackers to doctors, especially doctors uh, in North America, hackers have like a trillion more free spaces in this kind of technical sense than groups like lawyers or doctors. So what are some of free as in space? And, and these free spaces don't actually need to be physical spaces. It has to do with people coming together autonomously to make decisions. Requests for comments which were key in building the internet. BDS is an internet relay chat, the Free Software Project, the Hack Lab and the Hack Space, and the Free Software Conference. So one of the, I think, really unique things about hackers is how many free spaces they have, those that are both physical, those that are virtual, and those that are more like request for comments is a kind of protocol. And let me now provide some definitions of free spaces uh, from these sociologists, and you'll get a sense as to why they're so important for the kind of creation of alternative ethics and socialities that under certain conditions become great, great resources for political organizing. So free spaces are the environments in which people are able to learn a new self-respect, a deeper and more asserting group identity, public skills, and values of cooperation and civic virtue. Uh, I don't know if like this pertains to IRC in all cases, but certainly when it comes to things like the Free Software Project, uh, certain of these elements such as group identity, cooperation, and some form of sort of civic interaction are extremely important. Uh, Eric Hirsch uh, defines the free space as havens that insulate the challenging group from the rationalizing ideologies normally disseminated by the society's dominant group. This is perhaps one of the most important functions of free spaces, is that kind of commitments to, you know, the coffee left, for example, are nurtured in these sorts of spaces. Um, and it's not, necessar it's not necessarily the case that you're always fighting the dominant group, but you are kind of nourishing alternative ideologies. And then a third kind of characteristic uh, is described in this way, free is Free space is free because we do relate apart from our daily lives in these spaces. And while IRC or virtual free software projects are often part of your daily life, right? You uh, may be going to them to actually get work done, people still have a sense that they're special, they're different, they're not just work, um, they're not just entertainment. So they're kind of marked off in this way. So again, just to finish with this, uh, it's not the case that people, you know, use free spaces to always engage in politics, but they become extremely, extremely important resources when political mobilization needs to happen, and again, are the place where alternative ethics can be nourished. All right, so just emphasize something sociologically, so now on to a totally different topic, which has to do with the law. And uh, another kind of key characteristic is law and having go hand in hand. And actually, I'm going to quote uh, E.P. Thompson, who is this great, great, was a great historian of class consciousness. And he worked on uh, riots and crowds in 18th century uh, England. And this is what he has to say about the role of the law in 18th century England. I'm going to just start with the first part of the quote and read the rest here. He says, the law did not keep politely to a level but was at every bloody level. It was imbricated with a mode of production and productive relations themselves. It was simultaneously present in the philosophy of Locke. It intruded brusquely within alien categories, reappearing bewigged and gowned in the guise of ideology. It danced with religion. It was an arm of politics, 
and politics was one of its arms. It was an academic discipline, subjected to the rigor of its own autonomous logic. It contributed to the definition of self-identity, both for the rulers and of the rule. Above all, it afforded an arena for class struggle, within which alternative notions of law were fought out. And what's really interesting about hackers and hacking is that the law is there at every bloody level. And it is there where alternative notions of laws have been dreamed up and fought for. Um, it's also the case that for those hackers who are part of a more transgressive tradition willing to break the law either for fun or for, for politics, many have sort of spent years and years in jail or have that kind of prospect of jail front and center. So what is interesting to me as an anthropologist is how important the law is within hacking. And again, every step of the way, from civil disobedience to creating a whole entire legal universe. And obviously, as free software developers, uh, you guys have to know things like, well, what license should I choose? Is it compatible with this license? People follow uh, larger legal debates, such as the uh, you know, EU's desire to kind of bring patents to all software. Um, but one of the kind of interesting parts, again, as an anthropologist, and, and if you really tie it to the craft or aesthetics of hacking, is the way that what you actually do helps you learn the law. And so I put it this way in my forthcoming book. I say, the skills, mental dispositions, and forms of reasoning necessary to read and analyze a formal rule-based system like the law of parallel the operations necessary to code software. Now, what this means is not that hackers or geeks make for good lawyers, uh, because being a good lawyer is not just learning the law. You know, it's playing the system, uh, it's about certain emotional attributes, you know, it's a profession with its own etiquette. But what it does mean is that a lot of hackers avoid the kind of total frustration that comes when you're an activist or an advocate and must learn the law. It's relatively easy to kind of adopt because you're already dealing with systems that are very technical, that are very formal, and that you know have a large amount of information. So it's adopted very easily. It doesn't mean either that hackers like the law. I've heard many times where free software developers complain about having to learn the law. One person put it this way, writing an algorithm legally should be punished with death, a horrible one by preference. A lot of people are like, you know, the law is the problem. The point, again, is that given the fact that in today's world, if you're going to fight politically for something, there is a kind of unbelievable amount of legal sort of artifacts, knowledge that you're going to have to grasp. And this is a world that has grasped it. And in fact, in fact, I would say the hackers represent the largest kind of army of amateur link legal tinkers in the world, right? And that's kind of remarkable given the number of technologists in the world. All right, so a kind of closely related but slightly different topic has to do with the culture of civil liberties, uh, which is not the same as a legal sort of commitment to civil liberties. But I think hackers tend to foster a very vibrant culture of civil liberties. This is one small artifact uh, from the world of Anonymous that kind of captures that. And by culture, what I mean is that people are debating the question of civil liberty, like free speech and privacy, and they're creating all sorts of artifacts that kind of bring into being their commitment. And so this is a very kind of small example, but I'll give you another one. And um, before I do that, I think I'm going to um, quote Cass Sunstein, who's a legal theorist, and he's said it quite well as to why a kind of culture of civil liberties is so important. He says, a well-functioning democracy has a culture of free speech, not simply legal protection of free speech. Because you can never fight for the legal protection. You're never going to change the legal protection unless there's a kind of active culture. And to me, one of the kind of favorite examples of this kind of uh, culture of civil liberties um, within the world of free software is this poem uh, by Seth Schoen, and it is a recreation of DCSS, which was a piece of software that is actually still illegal under the DMCA, used to descramble DVDs so that you could play them in different um, 
in different devices. And what he did was he wrote this amazing haiku that was actually a reinstantiation of DCSS, uh, but it was also a plea to the judge who was hearing the case to say, you know, you think that this is illegal and a problem. Let me explain why it's mathematics, why it's free speech, and I should have the right to publish this, right? And um, I'd like to now give another example of this culture of civil liberties that has to do with privacy and anonymity and not free speech. And it comes, again, from the world of anonymous. Now, one of the interesting things about anonymous is that you know, there's a bunch of different operations, from trying to get rid of uh, pedophilia to support free speech to supporting uh, revolutionaries in the Middle East. But again, from the cultural perspective, uh, what is so interesting about them is that they perform the importance of privacy and anonymi anonymity uh, through things like their mask um, and then through their kind of internal ethics. And what's so fascinating is that they're performing it just at the moment that it's dying as well. And sometimes I'm not sure whether it's kind of uh, the party at the funeral for the death of privacy or whether, in fact, you know, it's kind of a party that's sort of saying, hey, you know, if we lose this, we're in big trouble. Um, one of the interesting things about Anonymous is that uh, for those that kind of interact among the different groups and nodes, uh, it's okay to uh, kind of have a pseudonym, uh, kind of partially persistent identity, but you should never take that identity and make it public and seek fame or recognition for yourself. That is completely, completely, completely frowned upon. People are chastised and marginalized. And so in that way, they're also performing ethically the importance of anonymity. Uh, so it stretches from the mask to the internal ethics. And again, it's part of this kind of culture of civil liberties. Now, of course, to have a culture of civil liberties also means that people should not be in agreement over what these principles are or how to instantiate them, which is, again, why uh, I think it's such a vibrant culture of civil liberties because while uh, Anonymous might take down a website um, and say, you know, that we're doing this to fight for, fight against censorship, other hackers will be like, no, no, you're not fighting censorship, right? And I actually think the debate is as important as the actions itself. All right, so the next uh, point within the realm of hacker kind of ethics and politics is what I think a, is a completely fascinating fusion of individualism and collectivism. If you hang out again with hackers, a lot of them will be like, I do what I do because I want to do it myself. Uh, free software projects create a lot of room for the individual to flourish. At the same, same time, uh, free software developers and other hackers have built these amazing collective institutions too. And in much of the discourse about hackers or new technologies, it's the peer production which is emphasized, the one-to-one. -one. And this is obviously exists and it's important, but it's only one side of the coin. The collectivism that's created by lots of hackers is as important. So in the case of free software, we have uh, new organizational forms which are quite institution complex. And they themselves, the actual institutional form, helps us to sustain collectivism yeah, yeah, and individualism. Yeah. Um, I'll just provide one other example that comes from a case study of <coughs> file sharing here in Sweden. Uh, and the author, uh, Jonas Anderson, has put this dynamic between individualism and collectivism this way. He says the paradox is that this individual autonomy, the autonomy to share files, relies on aggregated technical infrastructures which ultimately come to constitute collective formations or even institutions in their own right, albeit in novel forms. And I think it is really important to sort of get over this idea that individualism and collectivism are at odds with each other. Uh, they kind of can exist in strong symbiosis. And a lot of spheres of hacker action, a lot of those hacker free spaces nurture the kind of dynamic between the two. All right, so the next attribute I'd like to emphasize is, is almost very obvious, uh, 
that conjoined it with something else. But the, the point I want to start with is the question of meta-activism. Hackers create tools. In many instances, they release the tools to the world and say, do what you want with it. I don't give a shit. You know, Tor can be used by the government, by the military, and by activists on the ground. So it's a form of meta-activism, where in some ways, the most important part is creating protocols, tools, and infrastructure for the world at large to use. But this doesn't mean that hackers historically and currently haven't been involved very, in very directed ways in social movements. Um, they have been in very central ways, I would say, actually. Um, and it's not you know, necessarily the case that uh, this always happens, but it's important to highlight when it does. So I'm going to just emphasize two examples. Uh, historically, Indian media, which I consider the big bang of citizen journalism, was kind of dreamed up by a bunch of hackers who were very familiar with free software, who actually used free software to build the first kind of content management systems. Um, and they were an important source of innovation for technologies that later and disastrously became identified as Web 2.0. And by this I mean, you know, they allowed anyone to upload photos, to upload videos, they had very sophisticated content management systems. And what's interesting about the hackers that kind of dreamed up into media was that they identified as hackers, but also very much as kind of people part of the counter-globalization social movement. Um, and so they were one kind of group of hacker, which still is very vibrant today, which is the social justice activists. To take the more recent example uh, with Occupy, uh, which became quite big in North America and, and Europe, uh, Anonymous uh, didn't you know, call for Occupy, but they were a really important catalyst at the beginning, almost what I think of as kindling for the fire, um, and then eventually became an important publicity PR wing. It was kind of fascinating because when the mainstream media was first reporting on Occupy in the States, they were like just completely negatory about it. They're like, this is stupid, it's never gonna go anywhere, um, they were kind of writing it off, and a lot of kind of anonymous Twitter accounts were kind of being the cheerleaders at some level. And it played some role in helping to generate the enthusiasm and get people going. Um, so again, while I would say meta-activism has been more important for the hacker and geek sphere, there have been these moments where hackers have really participated in social movements. All right. So uh, point nine is one that I find really interesting, and it has to do with the ways in which the spheres of hacking are partially resistant to extreme commodification and can poach corporate resources. So in terms of the first point, um, you know, obviously a lot of things that hackers make are for the economic sphere, right? There's no sort of fundamental antagonism but there have been measures put into place to kind of protect them from extreme commodification. Again, the copyleft is the best example of this, a very, very kind of uh, innovative response um, to that problem of commodification. Uh, in the case of Anonymous, it's really quite interesting because there's nothing that the world of advertising does not want to take from countercultural, subcultural worlds, right? Whether it's punk, or hippies, it's like, hey, we are going to bring this into our advertising apparatus, right? And within the uh, world of Anonymous, which is actually so much about style and fashion and symbols, uh, well, the world of, of corporate America uh, is not really willing to embrace it because either they're going to get DDoSed or humiliated at the hands of Anonymous, so they're like, all right, we're not going to touch it and we're not going to run an advertising campaign. So that's a really interesting kind of uh, form of resistance to commodification and very rare. And I've been waiting for someone, some company, to have the balls to be like, we're going to run a campaign based on this imagery. But they haven't yet. Now, but another kind of side of this question of commodification that I also find really fascinating is that, you know, geeks and hackers are working in the corporate world as programmers, as system administrators. And there's, you know, again, millions of people adopting skills that then can be transferred over into the political realm. And what also happens a lot, um, though people may, you know, not everyone obviously engages in this, is that a lot of people use time at work to work on their side projects. There's a lot of extracurricular hacking that goes on. 
Now, this is not, you know, completely unique to the world of hacking. This, there's a wonderful, wonderful ethnography by a Harvard Business School uh, professor who looked at an airplane factory, and he worked there. And he discovered that so much production, or not so much, but a fraction of production was extracurricular production. And he came up with a term called a uh, moral gray zone to look at the ways in which workers and supervisors together engage in officially forbidden yet tolerated practices at work. Um, and I, again, I think that this, the case of hacking happens all, all, all the time, where people are doing extracurricular work at work. In some cases, managers actually know what's going on, but they're like, huh, you know, this is, in the end, uh, what makes my employer happy. It's actually relevant to this sphere as well, so why am I ever gonna stop this, right? In other cases, managers, you know, will walk by their kind of employees, they'll see this, and all they could see is that in translation. They have no idea what the heck it is, so it doesn't matter whether this, you know, is the directory related to the work or the extracurricular activity, right? And so they can kind of get away with it. And I actually think that this is extensive um, and would be fascinating project. And if anyone's a PhD student wanting to work on something, um, this would be a great project. Now, this is not to say that forces of commodification don't happen within the world of hacking. Uh, they happen in all sorts of ways. And I actually think Web 2.0 as a term, which came to encompass basically everything from Flickr to YouTube to Facebook to free software, to Wikipedia was a kind of disastrous collapsing of very different types of sharing, very different types of ethics uh, that unfortunately it's not quite a form of co-optation, but to the public at large it was a disservice for people not to kind of necessarily know the difference between tagging on Flickr and what was going on in Wikipedia. I'm not going to say anything more, but there are obviously those dynamics. Um, okay. Now I just have one more point, uh, and here we get to where I got the title from. Um, Weapons of the Geek is a kind of remix of a title called Weapons of the Week, which is one of the more famous uh, anthropology books. Um, and I would like to quote uh, from this anthropologist so we get a sense of what Weapons of the Week are, and we get a real sense as to why Weapons of the Geek is almost the total opposite. He says, um, everyday forms of resistance make no headlines. There is rarely any dramatic confrontation, any moment that is particularly newsworthy. And whenever the ship of the state runs aground on such a reef, attention is typically directed to the shipwreck itself, and not the vast aggregation of petty acts that make it possible. It is only rarely that the perpetrators of these petty acts seek to call attention to themselves. Their safety lies in their anonymity. The nature of the acts themselves and the self-interested muteness of the antagonists thus conspire to create a kind of complicity silence that all but expunges everyday forms of resistance from the historical record. And so the last kind of category, which I thought I had a number four, but I don't, is number 10. And it's the fact that hackers call attention to themselves. That it's uh, often viral, replicable, spreads in very interesting ways. It is not this at all. It is, we are here, we're front, and we're center. And this, again, depending on the sphere, works in very different ways. So to quote Evan Moglin, uh, for the case of free software, he says, practical revolution is based upon two things, proof of concept and running code. It's one of the reasons why open source took off uh, was by the time uh, developers were kind of telling their managers, oh, by the way, multi-million dollar operations are running on Apache and Linux, it was running. Right? The copula was something that was able to be adopted. To take a very different instances of the viral nature of some of the hacker and geek politics, uh, I'm going to quote Topiary, who was a kind of spokesperson within Anonymous who was arrested, right? A lot of attention from the state. He says you cannot arrest an idea right before he got arrested, right? Um, and what's so interesting is actually Anonymous is so different because it isn't about this kind of um, running code. It is an idea that uh, has very meme-like qualities to it, and so that people from India 
to Romania, to Brazil, to Quebec, have taken the kind of idea of anonymous and have taken it as their own in very, very different parts of the world. And actually, one of the fascinating things about anonymous is that it is a sphere that, in some ways, does need hackers to set up the IRC, to have the botnets to take down the websites, but it's much more open and participatory. You can have design skills, you can just you know, have a very prolific Twitter account. And so it's one of these spheres which is truly about the hacker and the geek as well. So just to wrap up now, obviously when you're talking about a forum of politics um, that is based on technical agency, right? Uh, you're gonna have kind of extreme barriers for participation. And, um, you know, this is obviously a concern to people. This is a theme here in this conference. How do you uh, encourage and open up the kind of gates? And I'd actually like to give you a sense of how dire it is in terms of the lack of digital literacy when it comes to this world. So I teach in almost in every class I teach, I get up there and I ask my students two questions. I ask them, what is source code? And who knows what a system administrator is? And the reaction I get is just, <laughs> just a blank stare. Like, I've just spoken Chinese, you know? And I'm like, oh my god. Thank god I'm here. We've got to change this. But this is just the extent. I mean, it's not simply that we don't have a lot of female participants in open source, which is the case, and a lot of diversity. I mean, we don't even have some basic digital literacies where people don't even understand what encryption is, source code. So there is a ton, a ton, a ton of work to be done, right? Um, I'm not going to say more about it. In fact, I kind of want to end on a happy note. So this summer when I was at DEF CON, and this was in part the inspiration for the talk, uh, it was the 20th anniversary of DEF CON. And DEF CON is not known to be particularly um, political, but there was this statement uh, in its program. It said, the story of how ordinary hackers tilted the paradigm of technology in power ever so slightly, closer to the little guy and gal is important. Maybe one of the most important stories of our time. And I like this quote because, uh, again, it captures the importance and role of weapons of the geek without kind of making it into a sort of revolutionary force. It's not hyperbolic, it's representation. And there are just so many different examples of weapons of the geek that exist in our midst that i just shown up there. And what I'll do is just leave with a final question, which is this. Are we in the golden age of weapons of the weak, or I mean weapons of the geek? Or are we simply at the dawn of weapons of the geek? And I hope the answer is that, that, that we are at the dawn and not the golden age, because there is truly a tremendous amount of work to be done. So hopefully we're just at the start in another 20, 30, 40 years, we can then finally say we've reached the golden age and have some beer. So with that in place, uh, thank you very much, and I'll take it open up for questions. Anonymous was like, well, we should protest the Church of Scientology, 
and you know, Scientology really went after its critics, and they're like, we have to cover our face. What is a mask we can all buy in the next week, right? And so it was a practical solution. And it's true that someone is making money off of it, but to me, that's what's so interesting, is that hacker politics isn't about purity, necessarily, right? And a lot of the left is like, we have to make everything pure, we can't have money, and that, I think, often acts as a barrier. This was a practical, like the classic practical solution. We need this, let's get it done. And what's so great is now that symbol is a symbol of the deep disenchantment with the status quo. And it, again, it exists everywhere. You know, it's really popped up in the most unbelievable places. And so, yes, someone's making money, but I would say it's symbolic force. It far outweighs Time Warner's ability to make, to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. Also, there are uh, pretty ma <coughs> a, a significant portion of the, the masks that are sold are probably bootlegs. Right, that's right. I didn't even think about that pirate mask. Even better. Even better.